is there, in terms of detecting whether you may have the first symptoms of Alzheimer's, is there anything you can do at home? I mean, is it only something that you can do in a clinic? Well, well, yeah. I mean, there are things you can do, but that nothing's guaranteed. And unlike some other docs in the U.S., I'm not going to say we can cure or reverse Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to claim we have Alzheimer's survivors based on protocols or, or, or lifestyle. But there are lifestyle measures you can take that we predict based on what we know from epidemiology studies and lab studies should help. I wrote three lay books um, with, a, with a fellow who I know is a little bit controversial in uh, Britain, Deepak Chopra. Um, I, I, I was the scientist side of, of uh, what we were doing. You know, Deepak is a, a medical doctor, but we wrote three books on, on the topic of what can you do to help keep your brain healthy? Uh, what can you do to help keep your genetic expression profiles healthy? Because you know, you know, something that people don't think about. You can't change your DNA, but you can, you can change how your genes are expressed based on your habits and lifestyle. And, we, and then we culminated that in the third book, uh, The Healing Self, which came out more recently. And, and f- when I had to go on the book tour for The Healing Self, um, I had to come up with an acronym for what are the, how do I summarize the lifestyle interventions that would help the most or would be predicted to help the most? So I came up with the acronym SHIELD. And um, I've, I introduced this acronym on, uh, you know, various TV shows and news shows. And now it's, and I, I think I tweeted it first and, it, and it, that's how it got out there. It's been around for a while now, but people know it. And even in the McCant Center for Brain Health that I co-direct, we use SHIELD as our guide for telling people what they could do in their their lifestyle. And SHIELD, the S stands for sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, And during sleep, you clear the amyloid out of the brain. You literally clean the brain out of debris that can eventually cause neuroinflammation. It's also when you consolidate your memories. You know, dreams play a big role. I like to say dreams are movies based on real events, right? They're, they're, They're fiction but they're based enough on real events that they, ha- they actually help consolidate your memory while you sleep. So seven to eight hours of sleep um, is the goal. If you can't get it all at once, it's fine to take a nap. As long as during that nap, you have a little bit of REM dreaming and a little bit of deep sleep, maybe drool a little bit on your desk. That's one whole rinse cycle of amyloid out of your brain, right? So Take a good nap. If you only get six hours of sleep, take a good nap. Get one more rinse cycle of that amyloid out of your brain. We jokingly call it mental floss, mental floss, getting the, 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 the brain taught or out of the brain. Um, the H uh, stands for handling stress. Stress causes the death of nerve cells. It causes co- uh, cortisol, which kills nerve cells. Um, and stress is a big killer. Stress can be another match in brush fire that induces inflammation. Uh, so we talk about meditation practice. We talk about managing attachments, managing separations. You know, it, the, the best definition of stress is that it's the response of the body to being separated from something to which you are attached. Um, it could be not getting an email in time back from a friend you're attached to that friend sending you an email back. Um, Anything that you're conditioned to be attached to, if there's separation from it, that creates stress. So you have to be mindful about that. And, you know, when you meditate, think about what am I attached to? And you don't want to detach, right? That's what life's all about, passionate attachments. But you want to be, you want to, you want to treat those attachments in a healthy way where they don't, they, they don't become pathological, right? You, you, you don't want to become codependent on anything. So that's H. Mm-hmm. Um, I is interaction with others, right? And this, this gets to stress because if you're isolated and lonely, and un- meaning oh, being alone is fine if you like it, but if you're lonely, alone and don't like it, that causes stress. And it also causes a lack of intellectual stimulation, which gets to the L I'll get to later, learning new things. But before that, there's E, exercise. Exercise is pretty amazing. I, 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 when I rank the shield um, letters, sleep is the most important. Um, I put diet, which is the D second, and then e, exercise third. Exercise, during exercise, you actually help clear amyloid from your brain in a different way. You actually um, 
uh, stop, help curb neuroinflammation. But most importantly, during exercise, we just published a big paper in science and another one in uh, Nature Metabolism on this. Exercise induces proteins from muscle in the body that get into the brain and actually cause the birth of new nerve cells in the hippocampus, the short-term memory area that is first struck by Alzheimer's. So you can actually grow new neurons in your hippocampus with exercise. And it also helps reduce the inflammation in the hippocampus, uh, which is the short-term memory area. That's the, the hippocampus means seahorse in Greek because it looks like a little seahorse. Um, so that's exercise. Um, and, and you want to aim at at least a half hour a day. You know, I got my recumbent bike behind me. And mm -hmm. before, we, before this uh, webcast, I was on there for a half hour at about half the total resi uh, resistance, you know, five out of 10, uh, doing 90 RPM uh, for a half hour. And that got my blood flow going and broke a little bit of a sweat, you know, uh, watch some TV while I did it. You do that, just do that, just do a half hour workout every day. And if you can't do a recumbent bike or something strenuous like that, then do an hour walk, just do a brisk walk for an hour, but every mm -hmm. single day, that blood flow, actually takes beneficial factors from the body made in places like the liver and, and other, other organs and brings those to the brain where they actually benefit the brain. Um, it's a whole nother story, but right. that's why exercise is good. L is learn new things. So right now, the folks who are watching, if they're learning something new, they're making new synapses, right? You have 100 billion neurons making trillions of connections or synapses. That's your neural network. That, that, those, that, that is neuroplasticity, you're shaping that neural network every day based on your experiences, the choices you make, the habits you have. Um, and the more you learn new things, the more new synapses you make, which connect to your old synapses and strengthen your neural network. So I like to say that if you look at Alzheimer's disease, at the end of the day, it's the degree of dementia correlates mainly with how many synapses you lose. So you can talk about amyloid entangles and neuroinflammation and the loss of nerve cells, but it, it, what correlates best with dementia is how many synapses or connections you lost as these nerve cells die. So I like to say the more synapses you make by learning new things, the more you can lose before you lose it. So you want to like, you want to learn new things and build up synapses like money in the bank. So as you get older and synapses are being um, destroyed by just a, you know, age-related brain pathology like Alzheimer's, the more synapses you make, it's like money in the bank. You're spending money, but you have more money in reserve so you don't go broke right away, right? So that's how to think about that. Um, and finally, D is diet. Um, and by far and away, it, and, and it's not just because I, I have it Italian genetics, but Mediterranean diet has been shown um, by far and away to be the most helpful diet. Why? It's highly plant-based less red meat, more fish. I'm personally a vegetarian. I've been vegetarian, although I do dairy since college. Um, and with a plant-based diet, what you're really doing is you're keeping your gut microbiome happy. Mm -hmm. So there are trillions of bacteria that live in your gut. There are over 8,000 different strains of different bacteria that live in your gut. We see the most, we, we, you, know, you eat a, can, a thing of yogurt, a probiotic, you'll see about 10 or 12 bacteria they list that live in your gut. Well, there's actually 8,000 different ones. And those bacteria determine from your gut to your brain, your gut brain axis, your mood. They determine how much inflammation you have. We can even remove amyloid from an Alzheimer's transgenic mouse brain by, by managing their gut microbiome. We can see direct effects of the gut microbiome on the amount of amyloid in the brain. And, you know, so this isn't woo-woo stuff. Right. A lot of people think, you know, oh, gut microbiome, that's that new agey woo woo stuff. No, there's hardcore science that shows gut bacteria control what happened in the brain. And so the key is you can take probiotics and eat yogurt, but more importantly, you want prebiotics. That's the plant fiber that keeps those bacteria happy and balanced, and then they keep the brain uh, healthy. So that's the Mediterranean diet and a highly plant based diet. So seeds, nuts, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, crunchy stuff that bacteria in your gut like. Not, not you know, um, 
chewy, processed, junk, fat, sugar foods. You can have those, a little bit of that for dessert, okay? Just because that alleviates stress. Or dark chocolate, that's an antioxidant. That's good for you too. <laughs> yes. So I had a couple of questions on that. So is um, so high sugar, so if you're pre-diabetic, is high blood sugar a risk factor for Alzheimer's? Well, you know, if you're, if you're pre-diabetic, um, you know, with diabetes, you get into neurovascular damage. So another risk factor for, big risk factor for Alzheimer's is blood pressure and, or having mini strokes or having neurovascular damage, which is, which comes with metabolic disease and comes with diabetes. So it's still controversial as to whether high glucose or insulin directly affects Alzheimer's pathology. Some say it does, some call it, call Alzheimer's type three diabetes. Personally, I, I need to, I still remain to be convinced of that. Um, but certainly diabetes is a, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's because of simply because of the neurovascular um, damage that can be uh, part of, uh, of diabetes. So also going back to learning new things. So what about um, brain games like um, Jewel and Back or things that, or memory games that stress your brain, but maybe you're not like learning something. Yeah. Do you think that's effective? So two things. So some people ask me about those, they ask me about crossword puzzles. I like to say if, it, if you're doing crossword puzzles in, in the New York Times, um, the Sunday one will probably protect you because you probably have to look something up in order to answer because it's so hard. You're learning something new. Um, things like Sudoku and these brain games that, that people can get at apps for or get them online, they are helpful by teaching you how to focus. Because as we get older, our bandwidth gets too wide. We become jaded. Um, we like to say you go from twinkle to wrinkle, right? You know, when you're a kid, everything's really cool and wow. And then you get older and it's like, yeah, so what been there? And so to some extent, these brain games bring out that passion to learn again. They teach you how to be focused. They're not going to help you directly, but by helping you to be more interested in learning and learning better, where you can make more synapses, it will indirectly help you. But you still have to take the time to learn new things. Right. You have to learn new things. And so one other one on learning. So would something that combines physical movement with learning, so like learning tennis or perhaps learning a musical instrument, would this be like the best? Or a well, learning a new hobby, whether it's gardening or planting flowers to a, to a new instrument or a language uh, or learning a new sport like tennis, mm -hmm. absolutely the best, combining the physical activity with um, learning. The thing is, the reason why learning is so great is not only do you make more synapses, but when you're task driven in the moment, you're doing a hobby, you're focusing on putting something together, you're doing gardening, um, you're focusing on learning a new language, you're focusing on learning how to play piano. When you're task driven, the brain is taken out of what's called the default mode network. The default mode network is the pathway in the brain you can trace in which Alzheimer's pathology is generated and propagates. The default mode network is active when you are most idle. Let's say you're sitting around obsessing about, about the past, you're anxious about the future, you're sitting there stewing because you're in this my way or the highway type of mindset as you get older and you're rigid and somebody upset you. So anytime you're reinforcing you, me, this is how I think it should be done, which let's face it, it happens more and more as you get older. The older you get, the more rigid, the more set in your way you get. That's the default mode network. The more you use that and turn it on, the more Alzheimer's pathology is generated. I'm not trying to say that people who have Alzheimer's are overly, you know, um, in that pathway, it's just a fact that that's where the path, where the where the pathology propagates and 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 spreads. Um, when you're doing meditation, when you're mindful, when you're task driven, even if you're on your phone doing a stupid app, you know some game like I play uh, some you know pool billiards game on my phone. Just that mind that that being task driven takes you out of that default mode network for a while, like sleep does, and it gives you brain a break from making uh, uh, Alzheimer's pathology. 
So that's another good reason for learning and doing hobbies and being more task driven. And in the moment, the worst thing you want to do is sit around on TV, eating eating your 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 uh, junk food, watching a show that teaches you nothing, while you're drifting off and 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 idling in an idle mind, obsessing about something that happened earlier that you're upset about or being afraid about what's going to happen tomorrow. That's the biggest recipe for driving amyloid pathology and Alzheimer's pathology. And again, I'm not saying people who have Alzheimer's did that. Everybody's different. Everybody has different genetics. You know, one lifestyle for one person may be great for avoiding Alzheimer's, but another person, that same lifestyle may lead to Alzheimer's because of their genetics. We should never judge anybody as to how they got genetics, I mean, how they got Alzheimer's disease, because it's different for absolutely everybody. But we're learning about what we can do with lifestyle that will hopefully help most people. And what we really need to do is trials to prove it, because, you know, everything I'm saying right now about shield and lifestyle, it's all based on indirect evidence. We we haven't done enough trials yet. There, were, there was the finger trial in Finland that showed the, the benefits of good diet. There are exercise trials we're doing now and sleep trials. But the lifestyle intervention trials are something that pharma companies don't do. There's no money in it, right? You can't sell sleep. Um, and but you know, uh, but that's why we start centers like the McCann Center for Brain Health at Mass General and other centers to start doing these lifestyle intervention trials. So when I talk to folks like you and your audience, I can say we know this works. We did the trial. We're not there yet. Right. 